I just want to say welcome back. It is good to see everyone. How many of you are, it's good to see your church family? Some of us have seen each other from time to time uh, over, the, over space. And um, I didn't, I, I've seen a lot of people who have come through the offices we've been working, but I didn't realize how much I really wanted to see everybody until I saw Scott Fisher at, at John's house the day that we worked on the fence. And I was like, Scott! Oh! I, I couldn't hug him, but I, I want, everything in me wanted to hug Scott because I hadn't seen Scott for, for months. And so um, that's when it really came home to me um, just how much that we want to see uh, one another. We want to see our church family, and I'm thankful that you are here today to, to worship with us, but we do want to acknowledge that there are still people at home uh, worshiping, and so we're, we are filming for them this morning to do the best we can to serve them, and so uh, we want to welcome those who are worshiping online, and I want to just challenge all of us, no matter where we're at, to continue to choose to worship. It doesn't make a difference if we're in a building or if we're at our front room, or if we're in our basement, or if we're in the front yard. The, the difference is that we choose to worship. Yes, some settings lend themselves easier to worship than others. And sometimes it's easier for some of us to worship together as a group. But let me let you in on another little secret. There are some people that it was easier for them to just worship at home. And for them to choose to come back is a choice. To come back and worship with us in this setting. And so I just want to acknowledge that we have everyone here, whether you're at home, whether you're in the building today, choose to worship, choose to listen, choose to respond to the Lord today. I'm starting a new sermon series this morning called Life Lessons. And in this series, we're going to be looking at the different biblical people and the lessons that we can learn from their lives. If there's anything that we need to know in these ever-changing times, it's how can we live. And some of the best ways I believe that we can do that is to look at the biblical people and look how they chose to live. Now, I'm intentionally using the term biblical people because often we use the term Bible characters, right? But they weren't, were they? They weren't reading a script. They weren't acting out their part. They were just living their lives to the best of their ability. And they were just trying to, to live out their faith in a broken world just like us, imperfectly, as Alan mentioned to us. All of us are imperfect as we live them out. But they give us the hope that it can be done. That people can live for Christ, can live their faith out, even in this broken world. And so we're going to be looking at that together, and we're going to realize that they live their lives in real time with real consequences for their choices and their actions. And as we look at their lives, we will find out that our life situation isn't as different as we thought. And it's not that different from what we see take place in Scripture. Our problems, sure, may be different in degree, or they may be different by title. But the material that makes up our problems, sin, and the brokenness of our world, and other things as well, is the same. The, the, the problem and degree may be different, but the, the materials that make them up are the same. We will find that these people were just trying to live out their faith, just as we are. And many of them were going to have the same questions that we have that we had to work through these last several days, that we will, con should say weeks, last several weeks, and we will continue to work through for the years to come. Here are some of the questions that we may have. Can I really live for God in the midst of this broken world? What, it, what would living for him look like day in and day out when we have too much time on our hands? Could I still live for God? What would my faith look like in those days? Is it possible to be faithful to God for a lifetime? You ever had that question? Uh, will God be faithful to his people? Is God going to see us through? Will we ever sit in our church again, worshiping with our brothers and, and sisters? Is God going to be faithful again this time? Do his principles that we read in this book really work in the real world? Do they really work in my home? Do they really work in my workplace? Do they really work in this world when everything's coming untangled? We will see those questions and many more because these are the ones that we wrestle with with our lives as we too have to live out our faith in a real world 
that's really broken. And there are real consequences for our actions and our attitudes as well. And we must know that. So as we continue today, let's pause for prayer again and ask the Lord to speak to us about how we can live out our faith in these times and in these days. And if you're like all of us here, we won't have confession today, we might say, maybe this time revealed more things about myself than I realized. Maybe you just need to ask the Lord, would you show me how to live again for you? Would you call me to a deeper level of living for you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be in your presence here. We're thankful for your word. Lord, we're thankful for these people who have gone before us. They were imperfect as we are. Father, they lived in a broken world and a broken society, much like we live in. Yes, it may be slightly different in degree, but Lord, the root cause is the same. It's the sin, and it's the brokenness that we see lived out. And Father, if we're honest, that we participate in as well. Father, thank you for all that you've done to show us how to live. Thank you for the power that you've put within us to give us the ability to live for you victoriously in this world. Father, help us to choose to live that faith out. Help us to choose to live out all those principles that you give us in the power that you provide for us. Father, would you speak to us today as we read your word? Would you challenge us today not only to get a pat on the back for what we've come through, but, Father, to call us to a deeper faith for what is yet to come? Father, you are doing more than we could ever ask or imagine, and you aren't done yet. Father, speak to us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue, the first uh, Bible person that I want to talk to you about is, is, is Philemon. He'll be the first one that, that we look at in this Bible character or Bible person life lesson series. Now, uh, let me just say, we don't know a lot of the backstory of Philemon. We only know a few things. Some of you right now don't even know who Philemon is, and I'm going to help you with that in just a minute and then show you more about him. But the thing that we do know about Philemon is that he was a godly man who tried to live out his faith in a broken world just as we, uh, just the same as what we live in. One of the other interesting facts is that there is one whole book of the Bible written to Philemon, right? And, and it's addressed to him and it, it addresses the issues in his life. Uh, which we'll get to in just a moment. But if you ever think that one person's faith and how they live it out doesn't matter or God doesn't take notice, then you should read the book of Philemon. Of the 66 books, this one is dedicated to one guy challenging him to live out his faith in a challenging life circumstance. My friends, that's how important your faith is. That's how important it is for you to live out your faith. Because God is watching, and those around us are watching as well. So your life does matter. How you choose to live does matter. And it matters greatly to God. And the book of Philemon, uh, the Lord has helped me to see that in a new way uh, during this time of study. The book of Philemon testifies to that for us. So if you would, turn with me uh, to the book of Philemon. It's the shortest of Paul's letters in the New Testament. Uh, if you have, the, the pew Bibles have been removed. It will be on the screen. But if you have yours, which has your germs on it, you're free to use it. Um, if you need to find Philemon, turn to the Old Testament. And if you find any of the T's, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, past all the T's, right after Titus, you'll find Philemon. And right before Hebrews, you'll find Philemon. So that's my Bible tip for you today. Did you know that all of the T books are in one spot in the New Testament? That was life-changing for me to figure out. Uh, so if you find a T, just look through all the T's. At the end of the T's, you'll find Philemon. And, and we're going to look at this uh, together today. Um, here are some details that we do know about Philemon's life uh, and situation that he is in. Philemon was a man who lived in the city of Colossae and became a Christian under Paul's ministry during his third missionary journey through Asia Minor. Philemon became a co-worker with Paul as they continued to spread the gospel. It hadn't gone that far yet. So as Paul makes his missionary journeys around and as more people are converted, 
Philemon is one of those people who was converted, and he begins to help Paul in the ministry. He helps Paul so much that he hosts a house church in his home. And he, he does that, and he allows his home to be used as a house church. And like many of the time and culture, Philemon was also a slave owner. And he had a slave named Onesimus. Onesimus one day ran away, and, and at some point he made his way clear to Rome. Now, I googled this so I could figure out how far he ran away, right? So depending on the route that Onesimus traveled, the distance between Colossae and Rome is between 1,300 and 1,800 miles away. So this guy didn't just run off to the next town. He went three countries over. And who would you think that he would just happen to meet as Paul's missionary journey continued on? Paul. The same Paul that had helped his uh, owner become a Christian. Um, Onesimus is in, makes it clear to Rome, and he runs into the apostle Paul. Now, we don't understand uh, how their meeting came about. We don't have that, but we're told that they met in prison. Either Paul was under arrest at that time, which we know he was incarcerated in Rome, or he was under house arrest in that time. So we don't know if they met in prison proper or in when Paul was in house arrest. But we do know that once again, through Paul's ministry, Onesimus gives his heart to the Lord and becomes a Christian. And he too begins to help Paul in his ministry. After a very short time, though, the apostle Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon, whom he had run away from. But he sends him with a letter to appeal for Philemon to forgive Onesimus and to welcome him back in love. The book of Philemon in the Bible is a copy of this letter that Paul sends back with the runaway save Onesimus to his master Philemon. As I read this letter for you today from the Apostle Paul to Philemon, I want you to listen for the ways that Philemon was already living out his faith, but I want you to also listen for the Apostle Paul to, as the Apostle Paul calls him to live his faith out even more at a deeper and more challenging level because that's the call the Lord is giving to us today. We may have been living out our faith and well done for that. But there are deeper levels that the Lord is calling us to live in and to live out. So listen as Paul calls Philemon to live out his faith in a deeper level in a very messy and complicated situation. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. This letter is from Paul, a prisoner for preaching the good news about Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. I am writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and our sister, Aphia, and our fellow, sword, our fellow soldier, uh, Archippus, and the church who meets in your, in your house. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things that we have in Christ. Your love has given me, such, uh, has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, your, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. That is why I am boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the, in the name of Christ because it, because it is the right thing for you to do. But because of our love, I prefer to, uh, simply to ask you. Consider this as a request from me, Paul, an older man and now also a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you to show kindness to my child Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus hasn't been much use to you in the past, but now he is very useful to both of us. I am sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. I want to keep him here with me while I am in these chains for preaching the good news, and he would have helped me on your behalf. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. 
I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you were forced. It seems that you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave, um, sorry, he is more than a slave, for he is now a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. If you, so if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this in my own hand. I will repay it. I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. Yes, my brother, please do this favor for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. I am confident as I write this letter that you will do what I ask and even more. One more thing. Please prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that God will answer your prayers and let me return to you soon. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit. There you have Paul's plea to uh, Philemon in these days. Have you ever noticed that living out your faith fre- frequently lands us in some of life's most messiest and uncomfortable situations, complicated situations. How many of you have tried to live out your faith and everything just goes smoothly for you? I don't see any hands up. Maybe there's some online with their hands up. No. All of us know if we try to live out our faith, we are going to hit difficult times. We are going to be tried. We are going to be tested. We're going to run into situations that we didn't even plan on or, or, or know Um, we're coming. Why does this happen? Why have we gone through this season that we've just gone through and we're not done with yet? Why do we have to go through that? Why does it make us search our hearts like Alan has said? Because of this. It happens because it's in these messy and complicated situations that it's in these situations that give us ample opportunity to learn to live out our faith in tangible ways. You could say that you're patient, you're loving, you're compassionate. But when the wax is heated by the flame, what comes out? When your life is squeezed like an orange, what comes out of the inside? Is it love and mercy and patience and generosity? Or is it grumbling, selfishness, complaining? My friends, it's these life situations that expose to us our heart and expose to us how we're doing living out our faith. These situations that arise in life will draw more faith out of us and make us exercise our faith in ways we would have never chosen on our own, right? How many of you would have chosen to not go to church for 12 weeks? Most of us not. How many of us have had the opportunity in the last 12 weeks to choose to worship ourselves. Not be forced by anyone. You could choose your own songs that express your heart. You could read your own passage. You could find your own sermon. You could write your own sermon for that matter, right? Would any of us have chose to sign up for 12 weeks of personal worship? that would draw out of us more faith than we ever had to apply, that would make us sing when there was no one else in the room to sing because we wanted to worship the Lord. Not we wanted to hear other people worship the Lord. We wanted to worship the Lord. My friends, these sticky, these difficult circumstances will draw out of us more faith if we're willing and give us ways that we can tangibly see what's really on the inside. What is it that comes out of me when I'm pressed? When I'm under stress, it's not easy, is it? And that's why these situations come. But let me share with you this. It's as we apply our faith in these situations that we learn 
that our faith really does work in the real world, in the most extreme situations. And it really does hold up, and it really will thrive under real world situations if we will but apply it. You'll find, wow, I made it through. Wow, I love God more today than than when we stopped 12 weeks ago. Man, I've learned so much more. I've worshiped so much more. If we will have applied, we will say, not I made it by by the skin of my teeth. I'm nearly starved to death spiritually. You could come back fat and happy and say, man, let me tell you what the Lord did for me in this time. He has been faithful. He has spoken to me. He has allowed me to live out my faith, yes, in painful ways. Yes, I had to put others before myself. Yes, I had to actually live out my love and my patience with my family and my children who would not go to school for eight hours a day. They were just there, right? Some of us know what that's like. Some of you don't, but you watched your grandkids and you were still glad you could send them home probably. This time made us live out our faith in ways that we may never have had the opportunity to to, to do it day in and day out, hour after hour after hour. When we were tired of waiting, what did we get a chance to do? Wait longer. I was ready to come back to church after two weeks, right? We waited another 10 weeks. How much time, how much grace has God extended to us that we might see what's on the inside? That way you might have a chance to exercise in tangible ways what's really on the inside. Maybe he called us to serve in ways that we would have never chosen to serve before. So it's as we apply our faith in these situations that we learn that our faith really does work. That it really will work in the most extreme situations. That it really won't break when it is put to the test. And that it will hold up and not only hold up, but it will thrive in the most challenging situations. Our brothers and sisters in Christ know this as they live in the persecuted church. We barely have a taste of what it might be to live like that. We have brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world that lived in more oppressed situations than we do. We got just a little, little, little taste. And in 12 weeks, we're back worshiping together. We know not for how long. Are you ready to sustain yourself in the days to come? The Lord is giving us time and opportunity to prepare. In this letter from Paul, Paul praises Philemon for his love and faith in action in the past. Did you hear that? Paul said, man, I I, I have heard these things about you. Your love, your faith, I've seen it in action. I've heard it. So Paul praises him for his love in the past, so let's not miss that. This guy was already living out his faith. He was already putting it into action. Maybe he thought for all he was worth, man, I was giving it all I had to do this. And Paul says, man, I see you doing that. Look at verses 5 and 7 again. He says this, I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. Your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. This guy was getting it done. He was living out his faith. He goes on, um, or follow my notes, sorry. Fleeman has been living out his faith in word and in action, but now Paul is going to call him to an even deeper and an even more mature expression of his faith. Look again at verse 6, for it says this, I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Paul acknowledges what he's done in the past, that he has lived his faith out, but Paul's going to call him now to a deeper faith, to a deeper tangible expression of that faith, and it's going to be a big ask. Verse 10 says this, I appeal to you, show kindness to Onesimus, because um, I became his father in the faith while in prison. He's saying, Onesimus, your runaway slave, got saved while he was on the run. And I want you to welcome him back. I want you to forgive him. 
Look at verse 16 and 18 there. He, no longer, uh, he is no longer like a slave to you. He is now more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother from a slave, from a, from a runaway slave. Paul saying he's become a beloved brother. He has become transformed. He's become a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me, Paul says. Paul is asking Philemon to forgive Onesimus and to accept him back in love. That's a big ask, isn't it? It's not just a story. Think about it in your world. Somebody has wronged you. Somebody has betrayed you. Somebody has run away from you. Somebody has stolen from you. But you're a Christian. And Paul says, man, I, I know you've been living out your faith. I, I've seen you been doing that. And you've been doing a good job. But let me ask you this. Will you forgive that person? Will you forgive Onesimus? Not only forgive, he pushes him farther, right? Welcome him back as a beloved brother. Not as a slave, not forgive him as a slave. Welcome him back in love. Not love as a master slave, love as a, as a brother in Christ. Friends, that is a big ask. Philemon is the one who has been wronged, isn't it? Philemon is the one who had been living out his faith, but in the midst of living out that faith, he is wronged by somebody who wasn't a believer at the time. Onesimus is the guilty party. He is the one who has committed the wrong by running away from Philemon, and he has stolen from him uh, on his way out, from what we can tell, because Paul says, look, if he owes you anything, I'll pay it back. So we infer that he probably stole some stuff on his way out. It doesn't take much life experience to understand, to understand the difficulty of offering forgiveness to someone who has wronged us. Have you lived long enough to experience that? Being wronged by somebody else? When you were just trying to live out your faith? I was just trying to do the right thing and somebody wronged me. I, I'm not the guilty party. I was the good guy in the story. Now you're asking me to forgive? I, I already did all the good stuff. Like, I, I held church in my house. Like, I'm living for God. I'm spreading the gospel. I'm doing the best. And Paul says, that's great. That's good. I want you to go a little bit deeper. I want you to forgive this one that's wronged you. That is a huge ask. I would not doubt that some of us know the feelings of offense. And for some of us, just mentioning that being wronged, we immediately go back to that. We can tell you their name. Our blood begins to run a little bit hotter, doesn't it? We get a little, is it warm in here or is it just the lights? We begin to feel those wrongs personally. Yet Paul is coaching Philemon through this life lesson and messy situation. And he is calling on and encouraging Philemon to respond out of his faith, right? That's what he's calling for him to do, right? Paul is saying, let me coach you through this. Let me encourage you. Respond out of your faith, not out of your feelings, and certainly not only by what's allowed legally for you to do. Onesimus was a runaway slave. If he was returned, he could be legally put to death on the spot, no questions asked let alone, a, let alone a, a slave that had stolen from you and run away. He could have been double, killed you twice if you want, right? Paul says, let me coach you through this. Don't respond by your feelings. Don't respond by what's legally available to you to do. It would have been legally fine for him to kill this slave. It would have been legally fine for him to exercise any of those rights that he had. Paul says, above all that, I'm asking you, respond in faith. Exercise your faith in this, in this opportunity and extend love and forgiveness to Onesimus. 
The reason for Paul's appeal to Philemon is simple. Because you have known the love and forgiveness of God in your own life, please extend that same love and forgiveness to Onesimus. That's what Paul is calling for him to do. The reason Paul's appeal for this uh, is that Philemon and Onesimus aren't really that different. They're both quite similar in the situations that they find themselves in, though they've been in this situation in different times. Philemon, too, knows what it's like to have once been a spiritual fugitive on the run from God, but he ran into Paul, and Paul told him the good news of the gospel, and he was converted. Philemon, too, had been under great guilt and, fu- and facing severe pen- penalties. We know the wages of sin is death, and the severe penalties that come is our eternal damnation. So, so just as Philemon's life was hanging in the balance, Paul saying, Philemon, or Onesimus' life was hanging in the balance, Philemon knew what that was like spiritually to stand before God with his life in the balance. Philemon, too, had needed someone to extend to him grace and forgiveness out of love, which he didn't earn and he didn't deserve. Paul's saying, your situation's really not that different if you think about it. Someone extended grace to you. Someone extended love to you. Someone extended forgiveness to you that you didn't earn, that you didn't even deserve. When you got when you deserve death, you got forgiveness. Who is it that gave Philemon this love and forgiveness when he needed it? It is, the Jesus, it is Jesus Christ, of course, through the death and resurrection that he has provided for each and every one of us. Philemon had been in Onesimus' position, but Jesus had forgiven him. Jesus had lovingly accepted him, and Jesus had given Philemon a new name, a new identity, Right? He was now a leader in the church. He was now a beloved child of God. Paul is saying, don't welcome Onesimus back as a slave. Welcome him back with his new identity. A beloved brother in Christ who's going to serve alongside of us to make a difference in this world. Philemon had been in Onesimus' position, but Jesus Christ had forgiven him, lovingly accepted him as he was, and given him a new identity. Now Philemon needed to do the same for Onesimus. And Paul is calling on him to do that. My friends, we too are being called to extend love and forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Much like Philemon, we will find that the only way The only way that we can do this is to, the only way that we can live out uh, loving forgiveness to others is to follow the model of love and forgiveness that Jesus demonstrated for us personally on the cross. Paul called Philemon to reflect on that. Remember all that Christ has done for you. Then consider the wrong that's, that's been done to you. As you are forgiven, you need to forgive. We have been freely loved and forgiven. So we must freely love and forgive others. No charge. No strings attached. Just free love and forgiveness. As Jesus sent his disciples out to do ministry, he gave them this instruction in Matthew 10, 8. Give as freely as you have received the healing, the salvation, the forgiveness. Paul's calling Philemon to do the same thing. No one charged you for your forgiveness. You didn't have to earn it. Freely forgive Onesimus. As believers, we need to recognize our ability and willingness to offer forgiveness is not a result of our personality. It's a, result of the, it's a result of the forgiveness and love that's been poured out on our lives through Jesus Christ, personally. Only in that way can we love and forgive freely. No, sorry, we, we know what it's like to need forgiveness and love, don't we? Each of us have been in that situation where we were the debtor. We needed someone to say, I love you. I forgive you. 
No strings attached. We have been there. We need to extend that same offer to other. We know what it's like to need love and forgiveness, and we also know that we didn't deserve it, and we didn't earn it. Yet out of love, Jesus freely offered us forgiveness, though it cost him greatly. Don't get over that. I'm not, cha- I'm not talking cheap grace. Just because, we fe- just because we freely give doesn't mean it isn't costly. It does cost. But someone paid our debt. Could we forgive someone else's debt? It's not easy. It is costly. But it is a choice that we have and it is a way that we can live out our faith in a tangible way to the world around us. So much more to say, but I'm going to press on. Today, as we prepare to celebrate love, uh, the love and forgiveness that Jesus demonstrated for each and every one of us through his sacrifici- sacrificial death on the cross, let me ask you this question. Which person in this situation do you identify with most? Are you in Onesimus' position this morning? Are you running away from God or from other situations and you just need someone to extend love and forgiveness to you today? As we take communion, Christ's love and forgiveness is still available to be extended today. You just have to ask and you will receive. So maybe you find yourself in Onesimus' position needing love and forgiveness to be extended maybe from Christ, maybe from someone else. Or there may be those of us who are in Philemon's position this morning, needing to extend love and forgiveness to someone else. Maybe the Lord is calling you to a deeper faith, to live out again a deep love, a deep faith, and a deep forgiveness of someone who has wronged you. Extending forgiveness um, in love can be one of the hardest life lessons to learn. But God is calling us to live it out. And by so doing, we will find that our faith deepens and that it will touch the lives of those around us. Allow me just one more point. One of the interesting things I said was this book was written to one man, right? Philemon. It's actually addressed to a couple people, but it's deals with his faith but how many people were looking on to see how he would respond all his house church if you will we believe the two other names mentioned at the beginning is his wife and his son at the end of the book there are uh, the, the other co-workers will say of paul and i'm sure looking on unmentioned is the community that has that knows when onesimus comes back that he was a runaway slave and he's been gone for a while Our faith, though we choose to live it out between us and God and then enact it towards others, there are many other people watching for life lessons. Does this faith really work? Does it work when they're really pressed? Does it work when they've been wronged? With faith in God, with his help and strength, we can live out our faith and demonstrate to them, yes, it does work. Yes, it does, it does free both those who are forgiven and those who are forgiving. It's a joint healing, if you will, over that situation. So if the Lord is calling you to that today, let me encourage you to step into that with his power, not your own. Remembering that you've been forgiven by him and he'll help you to forgive others. The world is watching to see how we will respond as Christ's followers. And he's calling many of us to go a little bit deeper. Yes, we've done good in the past. Yes, we've done other things. But there is more life lessons to learn to live. Let me just share this. We don't know how Philemon responded. We don't have a return letter. We don't know what happened. But we don't have to answer for Philemon and how he lived out his faith. We do have to answer, however, how we choose to live out ours. So how are you going to respond today? In just a few minutes, we're going to pause for prayer as we prepare for communion. 
And in those quiet moments, I want to ask you that if you find yourself in need of forgiveness today from the Heavenly Father, ask in those moments. Say, Father, I've been a runaway. I need your love and forgiveness today. And I believe that you have extended that to me through the salvation work of Jesus on the cross. You can ask for that, and he'll do that for you today. Maybe you find yourself in a situation where you need to ask for forgiveness from someone else. Would you ask the Lord to go with you this week to make that ask? Would you forgive me? Maybe the rest of us, when we hit that situation or the quiet moments, need to ask God, God, you brought a name to my mind, and you're asking me to step up and forgive that person. I can't do it on my own. But with your help, I will live out my faith, and I will demonstrate love and forgiveness as you have demonstrated love and forgiveness to me. Father, would you help me to do that this week? In those moments, the Lord will meet you there, and we will celebrate communion together following that. So as we prepare to take communion today, let us each be reminded of the one who loved and forgave us when we, were needed, when we needed it, when we were a spiritual fugitive, when we owed a debt that we could not pay, when we had wronged God and could not atone for it on ourselves, Jesus says, you put it on me. I'll make good whatever they have done. Just welcome them as my brother, my sister. And he has done that on behalf of you for the Father to the Father. Let's be reminded of that today as we prepare to take communion. Through communion, we celebrate the work of salvation through, uh, fulfilled through the death and passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. We also celebrate the hope that he is coming again. The story hasn't ended yet, nor will it ever end. He is coming again, and we must be prepared, and we must be living for him when he does. The Apostle Paul gives us some clear direction concerning our communion together today. And I want to read that for you, and it'll be on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 says this, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. The Lord himself ordained this holy sacrament, and he commanded his disciples to partake of the bread and the wine, emblems of his broken body and his shed blood. This is the Lord's table, and at it we are one. It's a feast for all of his disciples who look to him as Savior and Lord. We serve an open communion here at Central Fellowship Church, and that means you don't have to be a member here to partake of communion here. But what you do have to know is that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and then you are welcome to partake along with us. So everyone who has truly repented and turned from their sins and believed in Jesus Christ on salvation, draw near and take these emblems and by faith partake of the life of Jesus Christ to your soul's comfort and joy. Let us remember that it's a memorial of the death and passion of our Lord, but it's also a token that he is coming again. The children are welcome to partake of the sacrament at the discretion of their parents so long as they understand what Jesus has done for them. If you, I want you to get your elements out. So I trust that you've already picked up a bag of elements. 
um, on the way in this morning, would you please get the cup out of your bag and just hold it in your hand for a minute? Don't, don't open it together, or don't open it yet, the cup that is. Just hold it in your hand. Does everybody have one that wants one? If not, we'll have someone get you one. Does anybody need one that, ha- that doesn't have one? Okay. I want you to hold that in your hand for just a moment. Because we're going to take a moment of silent prayer, as we always do. And we're going to ask the Lord, Lord, would you search my heart? Lord, if I need forgiveness, I'm asking it for you. And this is what's available through Jesus Christ. These are representative of his death and sacrifice for you. Forgiveness is available. His love is demonstrated in what you hold in your hands. His blood shed. His body nailed to the cross to pay your penalty. So let's prepare our hearts and we use Psalms uh, 139, 23 through 24. And it just says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That scripture will remain on the screen for just a few moments, so we're going to let you have a few moments of time, silent prayer before the Lord before we continue. Would you take this time to search your heart this morning? Heavenly Father, we come before you today thankful that you've freely offered each and every one of us love and forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we receive it freely, but we acknowledge that it it was costly to you. It costs you more than we will ever truly realize. But we want to say thank you for making it freely available to us today. Father, through these elements today, we ask that you would help us to remember, to celebrate, and to be called deeper into the life of faith that you have for us. Father, these elements represent that we can't do it on our own. We need you in us. We need your power in us. We need your forgiveness first before we can head out and forgive others. Father, help us to remember today that as we celebrate communion, you don't call us to the same old faith. You call us to a living, ever-growing, ever-maturing faith in you. And Father, that is not easy. So it's only with your help that we can do that. So as we partake today, Father, may you remind us of this living hope within us, of this living power within us, that is more than enough to help us live out our faith and thrive in these days. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit that you make available. Father, we are grateful for you. We're grateful for your love. We're grateful for your forgiveness. We're grateful for your grace poured out on us. Father, remind us today of this as we prepare to receive, but also then to extend this same love and grace to those around us. Father, do your work in and through us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would take your communion cup and flip it upside down so you'll find the bread on the top. If you would peel back the bread, the the layer for the bread. Go ahead and get your bread out, and we're going to partake of that together in just a moment. 
I'm going to give you some time to do that. <clears throat> Just like the book of Philemon was written to one man that his faith might be lived out to the fullest, each of us have a token of Christ's body today that we might live out to the fullest all that Christ has done for us. Let it happen in you first and then go and live that out with His power. Take and receive today the body of Christ that was broken for you. Take and be thankful for what was done on your behalf. Take and receive thankfully. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the tangible expression of your love and your willingness for Christ to pay our debt as you gave Christ a body and he was truly whipped. He was truly suffered. He was truly pierced. He was truly hung on the cross in our place that we might know not your judgment and condemnation which we deserved, but that we might know your love and your forgiveness individually. Father, thank you for the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. We remember and we are thankful today that he took our place of punishment. Father, we are grateful. Amen. If you would flip your cup back over and then peel the top off to get to the grape juice. We will partake of that together in just a moment. <clears throat> Christ's blood was shed for us to wash us clean and make us pure. Better than any hand sanitizer you could ever think of. To be made clean, pure, whole once again. The blood of Christ was shed for each and every one of us that we might experience that personally, not just temporarily, but eternally. We are forgiven and we are cleansed, not in our own power, but through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Take and receive today what Christ has done for you, for we all need it. May you take and receive thankfully today. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us, that we might be washed clean, that we might be made pure. Father, we're thankful today for what you have done, that we might not only keep it to ourselves, but Father, that we might go forth and live it out for the world to see that truly faith in you, truly God's work in our lives, Christ empowering within us, is able not only to survive, but thrive in difficult and messy life situations. Father, through you, we are victorious. Through you, we triumph. Through you, we can live out our faith in victorious ways. Lord, we thank you today for what you've done and for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, uh, would you put your garbage back in your Ziploc bag? I heard a lot of you doing it while I was praying. It's okay. Put that back in there. If you would put that in the seat back in front of you, we'll get that. If you don't mind taking it with you and throwing it away, that's fine too. But this would help us just keep that sanitary for everybody. So thank you for your help with that. <clears throat> Before we stir too much more, I want to share a couple more things for, for, with us. For those of us who identified with Onesimus today and asked for God's grace and forgiveness, let me just speak to you. You have received it. Jesus hanging on the cross, you partaking, is a testimony that God's love and forgiveness has been poured out in your life. But let me also remind you, just as Onesimus became a believer, he still had to go and make things right with Philemon. He is, he was forgiven, but he still had to go and make things right in an expression of his faith too. 
And what did he do? He took the letter Paul gave him, and he went all the way back to Philemon, and he handed him the letter. Some of us this week who have, yes, been forgiven by God, may still need to go to someone else and ask for forgiveness. Let me encourage you to do that. It will be difficult. Take the steps of faith to do it. The Lord will help you to do it. For those of you who are on the other side and someone's going to come to you as Philemon, let me remind you today of the love and forgiveness that's been extended to you freely. So if there's someone that you are being called to forgive, extend love and grace to them freely as well. And know that God will make it right in all manners. We can't explain all that, but the Lord will will honor what you do to honor him to forgive others as well. Let me give you this benediction. May we each go forth to live our faith out in deep and powerful ways. Go in the love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit, and enact your love and forgiveness of others. You are dismissed.